once upon a time. And Algernon says to Cicely, would you be in any way offended if I said that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection? Welcome to Be Content. Do or do not. There is no try. Don't be a plonker all your life, Rodney. I've done the deal now. Welcome to the party, pal. That's what I do. I drink and I know things. So, cheers! Cheers! <laughs> I've not had a drink with a mate in a long time. <laughs> yeah, this is my first virtual pub experience. So. Is it? Yeah. Well, that's great. I kind of I kind of like that. I like that this this podcast is going to give people the opportunity to to get close to you as if they're on a date with you. Like, like yeah. Well, I'm sort of, because I'm living with Leanne, I've got none of my stuff here. So the stuff I have got is like, like I don't have any of my books, which drives me up the wall. So... Mr. James Atkins, welcome. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm very, I'm very pleased and privileged to be here. Thank you. And you, you are the first person actually that I've, I've interviewed. So. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we are those, we, we are those people on Facebook where your face popped up, and it's like you have 53 mutual friends. And yeah, yeah, 112. Not know you. Person. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about time you know each other. But, but we only sort of started talking during the rehearsals for Back to the 80s. Yes. That's sort of the piece of content that unites us, mm -hmm. which is back to the 80s, which is a, a popular musical. Um, so this show is ready to go through, uh, I say popular. So <laughs> it's, great, isn't it? it's because of the writing in it that I believe. The it's writing, it. the Shakespearean <laughs> yeah. quality writing. It's um, so that's the piece of, I've always, I wanted to start this with every, a piece of content that, that connects us in some way. I think everyone's got a piece of, of content that connects them. Uh, and that sort of nicely segues into what this is all about. So my plan for this is that there's pieces of content that define who we all are. And mm -hmm. I just want to know from you, James Atkins, what are the pieces of content that define you? So the first piece of content I'm curious to know, what was the first piece of content you physically remember absorbing a, a kid's TV show or a book or a song? Yeah, well, look, we, we touched on this. I don't want to give the, the, the magic of podcasting away, but we, we you, you briefly mentioned this when we were discussing this earlier on, which is Thomas the Tank Engine. Yes. Uh, and that was my absolute favourite programme when I was a kid, to the point that, I mean, do you remember VHS tapes? I do. I remember um, them very well. I had my, my I was I come from a very classy background where my father used to put the VHS tapes in those book in those th oh, wow. books. I mean, very classy. So, yeah. what do you, do you remember? I always say to people who don't remember VHS tapes, the amount of time that we've probably wasted in our childhood and youths rewinding things. Yeah, untold hours and hours of time spent waiting, watching, and trying to trying to press play again just at the right point. That you wanted to get to. Well, but kid, people will never understand that. That you know, gets to the end of the film and it goes. About <laughs> 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 hour. Or when you got a video out from Blockbuster Video. Again, kids of today won't know what that is. But you got a video out and someone hadn't rewound it beforehand. What a cheeky, cheeky. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. And we always there used to be fights with me, with me and my brother about who'd rewound it and who hadn't rewound it, <laughs> whose turn it was to rewind it. Hours of fun. My. My, when people reminisce of, of childhood, the best theme tune of a kid that stays with you is Gummy Bears, without a shadow of a doubt. Gummy Bears? Gummy Bears. You I might, don't... yeah, you, you might be too young for Gummy Bears, but my generation, Gummy Bears, Bears gummy gummy bear. everywhere. Yeah, you need to. So, I'm going to jot this down. I'm going to jot that down. So, go, so if you're if you're watching this and Gummy Bears is a firm favourite, let us know. That would be great. Thanks very much. So, and I was interested in something else as well. I used to, so when I was in the car with my dad, as a very young person, he used to play the same CDs on repeat. And again, for those younger listeners, I'll put what a CD is in, in the book. <laughs> <laughs> in joke. So, so, do you yeah. have one of those sort of, of tracks? Well, my yeah, so this is where my parents were a lot older than... Um, I, my, my brother's 15 years older than me and, and et cetera. I was politely referred to as a silly five minutes on a Sunday morning by my parents. <laughs> um, so oh. because of that, my parents sort of listened to, yeah, I have a, 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 a pretty strong working knowledge of Matt Monroe. 
Matt Munro, um, excellent choice. From my mother. My father, it, it, you know, is just used to have musical theatre on kind of constant loops in his car. So I know the songs in exactly the way you describe for musicals like Chess. I've never even seen Chess the musical, but I know, but you know every, every word. And it was the same with Miss Saigon. Miss Saigon was my favourite musical before I'd even seen it for years and years. <laughs> um, yeah, I used to yeah, listen to those tapes till they uh, wore out. Miss Saigon, I think I, I think I only saw it recently. In my 30s, I saw it um, and I knew it inside out. But I think, I think with a musical, it's better to know the story before you go. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. Because I, I don't think they're always so obvious when you're in the moment and you're enjoying songs and everything to necessarily follow the storyline. Okay, cool. Thanks very much. So, so Matt Munro and general musicals, but particularly Miss Saigon. Yeah. So what about TV then in the, in the, in the, in the for, formative years post Thomas the Tank? Well, I mean, still in kids, I was massively <laughs> impacted by um, Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds? <laughs> yeah. Thunderbirds was epic. I just was enthralled by the whole, you know, the Thunderbirds, the actual machine. Yeah. Right there, they were, to me, I was always, I was one of those kids that was like building stuff always in the garden or, you know, I built tree houses, I built go-karts, I built this, that, the other. I remember one summer we built a raft, two of us, for months and months and then took it to the lake, threw it in, it sunk, which was quite disappointing. So I had, I'd done the birds, then like going into teenage like it was all like saved by the bell uh, saved US, by the bell USA. like i can still remember whole scenes yeah viscerally yeah, yeah. i can still remember it yeah absolutely it is, uh, bell. love it and that was such an iconic theme talking about theme tunes that was that was a classic yeah yeah, yeah. well everyone knows that yeah. one everyone knows fresh fresh prince bella those those fresh prince those things were it was it was the it was the stuff that was on at like 4 4 30 when you came home from school Another thing for me related to school is the Sunday hair wash sort of. So, yeah. like songs of praise. As soon as that yes. came on, it had to be like there was roast dinner. My mum was boiling vegetables until they were grey. All the windows were steamed okay. up, and we had to, you know, bath and hair wash. Uh, and then like songs of praise was on. That that for me. If I hear that music, I, I sort of feel something. I should go. Should right, go there's a, definitely some homework for you there, James. And what I want you to do after this is record yourself. Go on your laptop, get the songs of praise theme tune on the background from that era on YouTube, and then tell us what's going on in your head whilst you're. Tell, whilst the you're presenter gonna... was Harry Seacombe, I can tell you that. <laughs> I like Harry Seacombe. Oh. Love Harry Seacombe. Love that. Cool. So that, that covers the teenage. Now, what we've not covered so far is yeah. sort of literature. We'll go a bit of highbrow, books and ting. So, do you, did you have any? Do you remember what you did for, for GCSEs? Yeah, I did John uh, like uh, of mice and men joins John Steinbeck. Everyone remembers their GCSEs, their GCSE, yeah. but that's about it. Any other books from that era that that captured you? I mean, I can remember when I was a kid. I used to read the Point Horror. They were called Point Horror. It was like a collection of. It was like the equivalent of a Mills and Boone type thing, but it was about horror. It was all about like you know, the the people went backpacking and got murdered, and there was a whole series of them. I mean, they were, they were aimed at like teenagers, so they weren't that. Horrific, but uh, so now we're into rebellious phase. Was this about time you had your rebellious phase? Is yeah, this... I was a, a drummer in a rock band. No, all right, so, okay. pretty, I was that guy. Yeah. So music is about to feature a lot more heavily in your life, then. Yep, yep. So I was into that. <laughs> I was that. People don't understand me. I'm so unique that I like rock and like the same band as every other teenager on the planet, which was Oasis to start with, and then Ocean Colour Scene, and then Blue Oyster Cult, and all that sort of stuff. Ocean Colour Scene was my band, though. That was like, Who? Um, Ocean Colour Scene was my the band that I sort of obsessed over. And another theory I have about content is that everyone's got that piece of content or that band or that artist or that author that belongs to them. Yeah, yeah. So is Ocean Colour Scene your 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 one? That is your your one ring. It's the period of time more than the. I, I'm not. I can't tell you when the birthday of all of the members of the bands were. I wasn't obsessed about them. It was the, I could, you know, it takes me to a place where I was yeah. with all my mates. We used to listen to it constantly. We formed a rock band. We did their covers. We used to go and see them on tour. You know, we, that it was just that sort of vibe. And we thought we were, you know, 
uh, tremendously unique and, and <laughs> you know, misunderstood only to discover every other teenager was listening to exactly the same stuff as us, just slightly <laughs> different band. Um, but it was all, let's say, it was all that o Oasis kind of period and stuff. So that's your teenage life then. So yeah. you're at school, you're absorbing content as most teenagers and, and re rebellers do. Yeah. And this is where it starts to get interesting, I suppose, from a content perspective, because what do you do in that sort of post-school era? Do you go straight into work? Do you, what do you do? I went and joined the Royal Navy as an officer. So I was at joined the Navy? I was an officer in the Royal Navy, yeah. So I had a weird, I mean, I didn't have anything for quite a while during training because you're up at four o'clock and you're in bed at 12 o'clock. So you don't really have a huge amount of time for music and stuff. But weirdly, um, I used to do divisions every um, every Sunday where everyone used to go out onto the parade ground and fart around and all that sort of stuff. But we had a Royal Marines band and they used to play the Thunderbirds theme tune, which wow. again used to... <laughs> so, Hang on, that, this is an interesting development. We've got Thomas the Tank Engine, well-known saviour of the day, the Thunderbirds. We've got horror, horror Point Horror, which is probably about some sort of catastrophe followed by a resolution. Mm. And then you go and join the Navy. Yeah. Yeah, I joined the Navy because I couldn't think of anything else to do. <laughs> <laughs> basically Fair enough. Um, i did my a levels and then yeah i was like i don't i don't really fancy going to uni so i went and joined the royal navy and floated around the world for a while hang on what year let's let's do the timings properly what year did you enlist 2000 maybe 99 okay so this is right at the dawn of sort of mobile technology proper as yeah. we so, so i i mean i didn't know anyone that had a mobile phone we used to have to go and queue up for this sort of phone box and sit in a little cupboard and like if you wanted to ring home um and then when you're on deployed i was deployed in the gulf for six months and what you know you think if you're deployed now you'd have a laptop loaded up with content and films yeah. and, and we didn't have any of that we didn't have what about books no books it, it's weird it's sort of void of content but weirdly has has um, become part of my content story going forward because I often use a lot of my pictures. I mean, I had cameras that, that were like, you know, it wasn't even digital camera. It was proper film. You had to wind it on sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I look at those and I, I sort of use a lot of those images because they're bizarre images that you don't get normally every day. Like, every day. That's interesting. Um, there's There's something in that, I think, because... You've got no opportunity in your in your day to day life to absorb content because the content you're actually absorbing is the training and the the yeah. military the military education that you're absorbing. So there's no time for any optional work. It's all the the stuff that your your brain is physically absorbing is is educational and is is vocational. But what's interesting is that because you are absorbing less content content in the traditional sense of the word, you're creating more. And I know what you do now. So mm. uh, so you're creating a lot of photos and, and memories in that way that you're now using. Mm. Is that because you're, a, you're not able to absorb them that you want to create them more? I think, I think producing content is one of the hardest things to do because mm. you do it, and, and this sounds so, so pretentious, but you do it and you put yourself out there. Mm. And the easiest thing for people to do is go, why are you doing that? Yeah. It's really hard. It's like... I made this like you don't have to like it, but I, I made it. it. Don't knock it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, you you go on stage and you, you you know what it's like when you're you're properly vulnerable. You're like, this is me, um, and it's you know you you do it, and I'm doing it with something ridiculous. So I get why people are like I don't understand that, which is which is fine. Which is the conquer um, cup, conquer cup, um, and everything to do with conquers, which actually weirdly started as I mean. Conquer Cup started as a family competition, but then I was having a conversation with some people that I worked with, and they were saying, you should try and create something around something that is ridiculous. Like, yeah, try and yeah. build an audience for something that has got no audience is ridiculous, yeah. which is where the idea spawned from. Um, and actually, it's been a really good creative process for me, um, because it sort of takes you back to how do you engage with an audience? What you know, anyway. Um, but but the navy actually, if you think back on it, like we we were young officers, so we weren't really allowed that much freedom. And, that, and actually, we used to. This sounds so weird, but we used to sort of put on our own shows. <laughs> like there'd be twenty of us in a mess, and we're not allowed out. We're on board ship for months on end, 
we used to put on little skits for each other. You know, we we had we'd break into the you stuff if you're under attack, you get these silo sticks. You just crack them. They haven't got raves, but we had them for important reasons. But you used to go and nickel over them. You know, turn the lights out. We'd have sort of like little shows that we'd put on and stuff. And so I think we were creating content. You just couldn't record it. Really. I think that's brilliant. That's amazing. I love the idea of the content with a small audience, but a, a, a completely engaged, like engagement, one hundred percent audience for. That's great. That's still well, great. We had, we had costumes that we made out of bin liners, and like we, <laughs> they're the thing that's in the in the navy. You get a tot of rum a day, but. It goes back to when we um, liberated Jamaica. They gave every man Jack a tot of rum. And when my dad was in the Navy, he still got his tot of rum. When I was in the Navy, you got a can of Grolsch <laughs> instead. Um, <laughs> so we, we used to have the, a lot of these Grolsch boxes randomly. So we used to make stuff out of it. But it's like, you know, you, you see these warship shows on TV. They're like, you know, flying the flag for the UK. And it's all this, but <laughs> below decks, they're dressed up in bin liners with grog boxes, just <laughs> trying to keep themselves. Or maybe now they've got video and laptops, they don't do this, but <laughs> that's what we did. I blame the Navy for a lot of my problems. I'm going to need at least four photos to put on throughout this during the podcast. I think I have a video of me, a, a photo of me in a bin bag, uh, uh, surfing on an ironing board, actually, on the bottom of warship. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I think that's brilliant. I, I thank you for that because that is stirring up all sorts of images in my head that I I needed. Frankly, thank you. No um, so that's the uh, that's the the, the uh, James Atkins the naval years. The naval years, yeah, the serious years. Um, so then, post that, what comes after that? What happens? Talk me through it. So that is when I I came out of the navy and sort of fell into marketing. Which yep. I love. It's my. I'm passionate about it. I love it. I think it's right up my street. But I completely fell into it. I I got out of the navy. My dad said, "Well, oh, you can have a week off. Then you've got two weeks to get a job, or you know, get a job." You know. So I wrote about three hundred letters to every company, like proper writing letters, not just banging out emails. So, yeah, you know, get every morning. You get like three or four responses that were normally like no. And for some reason, I wanted to be in finance. Yeah, I did. I did chemistry, physics, and maths at A level. So I'm not a brain box, but I'm not completely idiotic. Um, and I, for some reason, I wanted to be in finance. So I'd written all these things, and then randomly, I got a phone call from Panasonic, and they said, um, "How wedded to finance are you?" And I'm like, eh, pr "Pretty wedded." And they're like, "We've got a job in marketing." I was like, "I freaking love marketing. I cannot wait to go." <laughs> Um, and I totally blagged a job off the back of the fact that this CEO happened to be ex-Navy. He thought I was... Anyway, and I literally started as a T-boy in Panasonic. One of the things that sort of stands out in Panasonic was I, we, the 9-11. The, the, um, that was... Um, that was I, honestly, that was sort of, for me, the first time that I really got the whole world news thing on the internet. We were literally just stood around, and there was the whole office was stood around someone's computer and we saw the second plane going. It was just weird, like a properly weird experience being yeah. in the office. Um, and I guess you know, although sort of news, that was a that was a content. That's a, that's a bit of content that really stands out. As I can remember exactly where I was stood when that happened. Where we stood. I was. I, it was actually my desk, but weirdly, someone else was sat at it. So I stood behind behind the person sat at my computer. But it was, um, yeah, there was a whole group of us stood stood around. And like, you, I got a vivid memory of probably because of the subsequent news stuff. But I've got a vivid memory of the second plane going in, and just that sort of feeling of Jesus, what the hell is going on? Like, yeah. it is that sort of. It, it's far away. I'm not. You know, I'm not a panicky person, but. It's Distant like, in every respect, but but so close in every respect. Yeah, just that you know. Yeah, it was it was bizarre. So what if if there's one piece of content, it could be a book or a song or anything in that era that that stands out to you. What's the first thing that comes to your head? Um, probably Master Plan by Oasis. Weirdly, it's a song. Um, yeah, so you've gone back to cool. Oasis from where you sort of pre yeah, I mean, Oasis was, pick that yeah. stuff up again. Yeah, I, I'd say so. I mean, it's always a staple. And, and weirdly, Oasis, is, my nephews, they're like 19, 20. They're really obsessed with Oasis um, now. I was, I was really, I was really involved in, I, I, I was just trying to, so uh, the guy that founded Panasonic was, was a guy named Konotsuki Matsushista. And he used to write all of these philosophy books. I, uh, so, I mean, maybe those as books. 
and used to get given them. He and he was a prolific writer. I think I've got seven of his books. So you read them? I read them. Yeah, I I, I was quite involved in him because he was really poor. He started making light bulbs. Like he was proper like street urchin, and then built Panasonic, which Panasonic, at, the time, yeah. at the time was one of the giants. Um, so I sort of read all that sort of stuff, I guess. Um, I didn't know. I didn't know that the, the Mr. Panasonic was 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 really poor and, and came from that. So that's that's really valuable. Thanks. That's really nice. Yeah. No. He well. He he wrote a lot of actually considering who he was and when it, his era. He wrote some really insightful stuff, and it was all it was all sort of philosophical stuff. But it was all stuff like you know you'll never be able to do your job for five years. It takes you five years to learn how to do your job. And yeah. So, that, that informed a lot of the Panasonic business principles, which is way ahead of its time. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and, and yeah, it was, it was great. Like, um, so what about a piece of tangible content? What can we take away from Japan and China then that, that, you, that you remember? I've got a defining piece of content that I wrote down right at the beginning, which is, which is sort of in this area, which is, which is something that basically convinced me to set my own business up and it's a very specific piece of content go for it let's have it so there is a company called dollar shave club i don't know if you've ever heard of it dollar shave club go for it dollar shave club is the now if you you know everyone does these razors shipped to your door yeah you know the company that started it was a company called dollar shave club and their their advert you, you look at it on youtube afterwards their first advert it was phenomenal. It, it changed my life. And, and I was working at HTC, mobile phone company, and I left HTC and set up my own smartphone company. Off the because of this advert? Because of that bit of content. It's, just, just, it's just so clear. It's all like, just forget the bullshit, man. Just, we make great quality products. And that's all it is. Um, it, it is just phenomenal. Um, oh. Yeah. I can't give it that. You should, get, if you, you know, take a look at it. It's a I'm Mike. Founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades, an aloe vera lubricating strip, and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up. Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandra, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. So what was it about that? What was it about that that piece of content that made you change your mind? What was it about that you went right? Just, let's do it. I think it just stood out. If you look at it now, it's like one of those things. Sometimes you think that was so groundbreaking, and then you look at it again, and you're like, that was crap. Um, you know, it's not. It's like things are immortalized, like The Exorcist. <gasps> Exorcist, super scary film. It's not that freaking scary when you look at it. It was just, at the time, it was proper scary. Yeah, and I think Donald Shave Club for me was just at the time it just cut through the bullshit. It went against the grain, and it, it sort of it played the little business card. It was like I'm going to take on Gillette. It's all about razors. I'm going to take on Gillette. I've got no money. We're working out the back of our garage, and they completely used that to their advantage. And they were like, "Why are you wasting all your money on this? It's a freaking razor. Get a life." That that's sort of a nice segue from from Panasonic to what you're doing now. Yeah. Is there anything in between that? Any books that you read? Any monumental things that you absorbed or or bands that hit you? We're now sort of post oh one. We're sort of. I think, I think um, in terms of books, I mean, like for business, I I I have to. I, I'm not a big reader of um, kind of fiction. Um, I wish I was, but I, I'm just not. Um, 
but but actually during that time got into big into people like Malcolm Gladwell um all of that that kind of I wouldn't sort of say self-improvement but but certainly from a marketing perspective trying to get under the skin of what it is that people do so you know talking about thin slicing and all that stuff that Malcolm Gladwell is you know it, it, a kind of a giant in the world of marketing so I read a lot of his books and, and massively enjoyed them about you know understanding nudge theory and tipping point and all that sort of stuff so I, I, I think that they were pretty influential on me. You said they've been helpful in your career? Yeah massively I think and and, and then the the MBA is a, is a I did an executive MBA and that that was huge um, yeah. and the content is very specific to me but what year was that uh 10 2010 what were the content items that stick out in, in the first company that you created kazan well kazan well, that became wiley fox said i mean there's some that i obviously i created all of that content so i could i, I know it all but but actually the brand kazan we were like we, we we started with kazan we evolved it into wiley fox and there are a lot of external influences kazan was the better brand wiley fox was the better name if we'd have if we could have had those two together it would have been golden better. yeah it really would have done but the brand of kazan was completely influenced by dollar shave club it was all about no nonsense it was about just say what it is and it was very cheeky and so all of our content was all a little bit like um you know, tongue in cheek, and you know, we used to give away free protection with our phones. Um, and when you open the box, you've got a condom in it as well. Our investors were were massively up. Just to be careful what I say, but they were not. I think they thought they were exceptionally good marketeers, and we launched the world's slimmest phone. And we did this advert, which I was against from day one. I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. And we put it on TV and it got banned by the ASA. We, we <laughs> aired it three times and it got banned, which... Why? Uh, because it was just horrifically sexist. It was like a woman just prancing around in her undercrackers. Um, you know, the phone was in it for three seconds, I think, of a 30-second advert. And if you if you knew my investors, you'd go, yep, that's the kind of ad there, mate. But Under their name, undercrackers. Their name, undercrackers need some unpicking. <laughs> just in her underwear. Her undercrackers. That's horrific. She she was just in her underwear ironing a shirt. The gag was she's ironing a shirt. She puts the shirt on, takes the phone out of the pocket. Oh, didn't realise the phone was in the pocket when she ironed it because it's the world's slimmest phone. Jasper Carrot had a, a song banned by the BBC and yeah. lots of, of attention because of it. And he he said it was the best thing on the worst thing that happened because as soon as it got banned, everyone flocked to it and listened to it. It was the B side of one of his records. Uh, and everyone flocked to it, and he said, "Oh, why is it? Why is it banned?" And Jasper Carrot's response was, "Oh, because it's crap." <laughs> that was his only response. You just reminded me. You talked about tapes in your parents' car. My dad loved Jasper Carrot, and he had the <laughs> audio books of Jasper Carrot. Yeah, only one way to get rid of a mole, all that sort of stuff. Um, all that. <laughs> I can remember it. Like Carrot. it was- Jasper Carrot is one of the most underrated comedians of of the modern world. I I, I would say that to anyone. I remember all the sc- nutter on a bus, mole, yeah, yeah, insurance claims, yeah, yeah, all that jazz. He was yeah. brilliant. He was brilliant. I can recall the stuff even now. Um, so I, I, I engaged with that. He was he, he used to do a lot of driving. He was a salesman, and he had these audio books like. Um, Patrick O'Brien, who yeah. wrote naval stuff, and it was always about like sharp. But did Patrick O'Brien do the sharp series? Um, I don't know, but very probably it's that is very much that genre. Yeah, and it, Hornblower it, it, and all that. Pa- pa- Patrick O'Brien wrote Master and Commander, which was made into a film by um, uh, with Russell um... Russell, Russell Russell Grant. <laughs> 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 Russell, no, probably not. Probably not. Russell Crowe, maybe. Maybe Russell Crowe. <laughs> Russell Crowe. And Russell the Crow. letter of two weevils, Joe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so he wrote that, and I remember I had a, like getting into his car and hearing words. Oh, I hate it. Was like oh, you know fuck that. Yeah. No, I remember yeah. the same feeling. I had exactly the same feeling. So, were you a visual? Do you, do you know if you're a visual learner? Then, if you're a, a, a visual. Or a well, kinesthetic or an auditory or what are you? Music, I, I love music. I love musicals. I love opera. I love I love pop music, but I don't I don't sort of I don't keep up with the 
the charts and the the the, the hit parade. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I, you know, I love listening to like you know, I properly, you know, go mental in the car when I'm listening to some sort of you know, Phantom or Lame Is or something. Um, okay, but yeah. So let's do it then. You're on a desert island. I've got to do the desert island discs bit. Yeah. You've got one track you can listen to for the rest of time. Yeah. Only one. Yeah, Better Day by Ocean Colour Scene. Better Day by Ocean Colour Scene. Do you honestly, I look at it now and I, you know, you know how you're like, um, oh yeah, uh, so and so is my best mate. And then you think about it, you're like, he hasn't been my best mate for years. I've got loads of other mates. But you've said it so many times that you're like, yeah, yeah, and it, and better day for me has been my favourite song for so long, and it is. It means so much to me. But I, there are probably better songs out there. Um, Moon River means a lot to me um, because of my parents and who are not around anymore. And again, I think I think it becomes more important when you lose people. If you know what I mean, that can make a, that can make a piece of content mean more to you. Is the for sure. Is what it comes with, you know, and the emotional, the emotional connection it has. It was their song that they had played at their wedding. Um, it was their right. like first dance, whatever they call it. Yeah. And it was, um, yeah, it's, it's something that is quite a pretty song. But it, but but now it's one of those songs that when I hear it, I I stop and I think, oh, you know, that that really sort of brings both of them, um, you know, to sort of front of front of mind. And I, I celebrate it. I'm not I'm not a, like if I hear it, I don't. I, I, I love hearing it on one of my yeah. songs um you know and i want it to be involved in my life like you know um i'd like to i'd like to sort of have it on, on my wedding or whatever it, it would be That's something okay. that that sort of yeah i want to sort of take ownership of it but but i mean again yeah that is a, a suddenly a piece of sort of benign content that is very important to me but so yeah. whose version of moon river because obviously there's four thousand and twenty six versions of moon river andy andy williams andy williams yeah Correct. If you had, if you had to say that one person in your life that gave you the most pieces of content or the most time worth of content to absorb, who's that? Um, probably a guy called Glenn, who was my best friend and is still a very good friend. So another piece of homework: you have to invite him to this podcast to be no. part of it because he's a con he's a contributor of good content, and I know I've had it from the horse's mouth. So so that's yeah. another piece of homework for you. No problem. Okay, cool. Okay, so lastly, we, let's go to the modern day. Unless there's anything else I've missed? No. Modern day. Talk to me about how you absorb modern content. I'm talking podcasts. I'm talking blogs. I, blogs. I am a massive... So blogs never interested me, although weirdly I write one now. <laughs> I'm, I honestly never re read a blog, not interested in them at all. Podcasts, for some reason, I... I, I consume podcasts like they're going out of fashion. I have, you know, people have their favourites. I have, I, I counted them up. I have 33 that I listen to every week. Um, every week? Every week. Well, actually not all of them put content out every week, but most of them do. Are you absorbing more content now than you ever have in your life? Yeah, but you do it in a different way, don't you? So they used yeah. to call it appointment. More passive, week. right? Well, and, and also they used to, call, so there's, weirdly this is my my job being in tech and tv and all this sort of stuff is they used to call it appointment to view yeah as a family you would have um songs of praise on sunday night and you would all up oh, that's the appointment we're all going to sit down and view it nowadays live tv or well, appointment to view doesn't really exist the only time it really yeah. exists is when it's a live event like a football match where you have to be seeing it that that specific time most content is time shiftable and most people are doing what they call dual or, or triple screening. So most people have their laptop out while they're watching television. Totally. So thank you very much, Mr. James Atkins, for being the first person to join Be Content. Hopefully. Do you, do you feel content? I do. I've had a really good time. I've drunk quite a lot of gin. <laughs> yeah, I've drank a whole bottle of wine, so that's a sign of a good night. <laughs> You've got a whole other one to do as well. <laughs> I do.